Hello everyone, my name is Darla Saunders and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. This series is made possible in part thanks to the contributions of the Government of Canada. For today's webinar, we're very pleased to be hosting Ben Matthews, a watershed restoration specialist for the Nature Conservancy in Maine. With a focus on reconnecting diadromous fish migration routes, Ben works with state and municipal officials to restore fish passage and increase flood resiliency in critical geographies across the state. He is heavily involved in the full spectrum of this work, from the development of decision support tools to providing construction oversight for project implementation. Prior to working with TNC, he spent 10 years with Trout Unlimited, assessing fish population health and planning rehabilitation projects for stream restoration efforts across the central and northern Appalachian range. He spends many of his off work hours monitoring fish populations through innovative hook and line sampling techniques and welcomes any new leads on good survey locations. After the presentation, we'll be opening up the floor for a question and answer session. You'll have the option of asking your questions directly using your microphone, or you can type them in and we'll read them aloud. I will now turn the webinar over to Ben. Great, thank you, Darla. And thanks everyone for uh, being willing to learn a little bit more about um, road stream crossings and how we might design these better to increase uh, fish migration uh, routes and, and help uh, with flood resiliency. So um, I'm gonna take some time today to, to talk to you guys about um, briefly why I think this intersection between flood risk and fish passage um, is important uh, based on some of our data and then dive into kind of the, the priority or the um, criteria that you need to know in order to design these things correctly. Um, I do wanna caveat this, that this is normally a, um, a two or three day um, workshop that we give and it's based off of a stream simulation uh, design manual that the US Forest Service has created. So I don't expect, and I would strongly caution against going out and replacing a crossing based only on what you see in this presentation. This is just to give you a brief understanding of, of what you need to look for. Um, and you probably would wanna get a little bit more training if you wanna go actually implement these things tomorrow. Um, so I'm assuming that most people on this call have a decent understanding of why um, road stream crossings are important for fish passage. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about the, the benefits of replacing these things um, ecologically. Um, I think most people should understand that when you have a crossing that looks like what you see on the screen here, um, there's a significant perch. Um, there's not much water depth in the culvert. Upstream is ponded and likely pretty warm. All of these things prevent problems for fish trying to get from one side of the road to the other. And typically these are on um, very important headwater streams or a portion of them are on very important headwater streams that are critical for salmon spawning as well as other species. Um, what I find uh, exciting about this work is that when you see problems like this on the landscape, they very often end up as a problem like this. Um, they, they often will wash the road out because they're undersized and cause a problem for public safety and infrastructure. Um, so I, I had this thought that if we could figure out where these things intersect, um, we would be able to fund this work better and make a much better compelling case on why it's important to upsize these crossings for fish passage because you get the ancillary benefit of also decreasing flood risk and increasing flood resiliency. Um, so in Maine, we're blessed at having um, a very comprehensive data set of almost all of the road stream crossings um, in the state. Um, this map's a little outdated, but to date we've got um, just over 25,000 points. Um, we've cut about 95% of the state covered where we have sent a, a crew to get geometry measurements and some other measurements at every single one of those points over the past 10 years. And I, I took that data um, and, and with this question in mind of where is there overlap between problems that for fish passage um, and problems for, um, for flooding and overtopping the road and washing roads out. Um, and when I looked at that, I discovered that um, about 10,000 of those crossings we've identified as being significant fish passage barriers. Um, about 5,000 um, of those crossings will overtop the road at a 25 year storm event which I've identified as, as likely happening frequently enough that that's a significant problem for infrastructure and public safety. Um, and if we look at where those two overlap, 
we actually end up with a Venn diagram that looks more like this, where um, almost all of the culverts uh, that are problems for people are also problems for fish. So this allows us to get to a subset of crossings that are pretty low hanging fruit that we can achieve very good conservation outcomes um, by solving problems for public infrastructure. Um, and that's why I, I got into this work. I think it's really uh, an interesting uh, place to try to put our, our funds because it's, it's a really easy argument to make to a town manager or a, a road manager that this, this culvert's a problem for your road. We want to replace it for fish. A lot of times they don't care that, that you want to replace it for fish. They just want it to be upsized so that they don't have their road wash out anymore. Um, so uh, we're going to dive into, into the, uh, the details here a little bit more. Um, this is a nice graphic to talk about how um, culverts were traditionally installed, hydraulically designed culverts, and how um, we're going to talk about what, how we would design an ecologically designed culvert. Um, ecologically designed culverts um, has the terminology around that, you'll hear me say today, maybe stream simulation design or stream smart. Um, they're all referring to the same idea where you're creating a crossing um, that can pass uh, fish up through it and also will pass sediment and debris flows down through it. Um, typically culverts were designed in the past, probably till about 15 to 20 years ago. Um, if an engineer designed a culvert, they only calculated how much water they needed to pass from one side of the road to the other. And that these culverts do a very good job of that. They pass water from one side of the road to the other. What they don't do is they don't pass fish up and downstream because of the obvious problems with perching and high velocities through the culvert. And they also don't pass sediment down through. Um, one of the major functions of a natural stream channel is that it, it passes um, sediment at higher flows and it's kind of a conveyor belt of um, substrate and sediment um, during flood events. You have an input from erosion in the watershed that puts sediment into the stream and then that moves its way down the stream until the flood um, waters drop and it falls out and then that continues to happen as you get um, more higher and lower flow events. These hydraulically designed culverts do not take that into account. So they don't allow for that passage of sediment, which is part of what causes these issues with, with fish passage and the perching of the culvert. So the ecologically designed culverts are not only thinking about passing fish from one side to the other, but also thinking about passing sediment um, down through the culvert, as well as um, debris flows during those high events when you've got wood and other things that might be coming down through. These are sized large enough to handle that so that they will act like a stream. And you'll hear me say that, and you'll see that several times in this presentation, that the goal of this is to let the stream act like a stream. We wanna create a large enough crossing um, that is, has the right criteria so that the stream will act the same way that the stream would be if that crossing wasn't there. If we can do that, that solves a lot of the problems for fish. So we're not typically designing specifically to say we want velocities of less than two feet per second so an alewife can swim prolonged through the culvert, but more we're saying if we design a stream that matches the stream upstream and down, then whatever fish that can swim through that stream will be able to swim through that culvert. Um, I'm using the term stream smart for this. This is uh, most of the slides I pulled from a stream smart presentation. This is a program that was developed by Maine Audubon, as well as uh, partners such as the Nature Conservancy, uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service and others, um, that we train uh, town managers, engineers, foresters on how to install these things. Um, and so I just wanna give a good shout out to, to that program and make sure that they get full credit because this is a large part of this is coming from that. Um, the Stream Smart, where we always start with this, um, is, is the, the very basic. If you're building a road, the first thing that you want to think about is, do I even need to put a crossing in? Is there a way that I can build this road that I don't have to cross the stream and can avoid the headache of having to maintain a crossing? If, if that's not the case, if you have to put the road in, then we can move to one of these other options. Um, and then if we're replacing a culvert, can we just remove it? Um, do we need the road there? Is it a possibility to just not have that infrastructure there? That's definitely preferable from a stream standpoint, from a fish passage standpoint. Um, today, we're mostly gonna talk about these two options, um, the open bottom structure that spans or exceeds the channel or an embedded culvert. If you have to have a crossing, these are the two best things that you can do. Um, I also have this hydraulic design uh, technical fishways down here. Um, this is an option. Typically, we only like to see that used in specific situations, often tidal culverts, where you don't have the option to create a stream channel through the culvert for some reason. Um, and so you really need to get a, a good fish passage engineer to design some type of 
like fish ladder or baffles through your culvert that will allow um, fish to make it through. The problems with that is usually those will work for whatever species you're targeting, but they won't work for numerous species. And we like to have these solutions that will work for all the species in the stream that need to get through it. So today we're gonna to talk about the open bottom structures and the embedded culverts. And just to give you some ideas to what these look like, um, these are a couple of projects that have been done over the past couple of years. Um, you'll see a theme that they're all significantly bigger. Um, that's partially due to the fact that we want to give the stream enough room, um, as well as we also design these things um, as, as our design criteria to pass a 100-year flood event. So that means they have plenty of capacity to handle those debris flows and handle those large flow events. Um, this is an embedded box culvert. So this was a well, well done um, substrate sample. So you can see upstream, it looks very similar to what you see inside the culvert. There's about two feet of sediment um, of this type of sediment in here and a complete bottom on this culvert. Um, the other options that we have is the open bottom box. So this is, there's no bottom on this. There's just footers. There's concrete blocks that are buried beneath the stream bed, beneath the scour depth. Um, and then basically just kind of, it's a bridge that comes up and there's just some banks here uh, at, at roughly bank full width. Um, this is a little misleading because of the size of the picture. That's only about a two uh, foot pipe. And this is probably about a 16 foot width here. So it is a significant upsize. Um, another one, these concrete arch culverts, there's a contractor here in Maine who's uh, making these. They're very cost effective. They just come in sections and you put them together. Um, the section is just this arch and then you put you perch it up on some footers here that again are below the scour depth of the stream. Um, another very good option. And again, we're upsizing, you know, two or three times the cross-sectional area of this pipe to make sure that we have a nice stream going through it. And then in, in low, um, low risk situations in, on forest roads, you can put in uh, just a, a regular bridge hemlock deck with some steel stringers um, on uh, concrete waste block abutments. These are super cost effective, pretty easy to do. Um, and what we're talking about today is probably getting a lot of practitioners towards this. This is low enough risk that a lot of people can do this without needing to get a lot of engineering done and paying a lot of money for that piece of it. So we're gonna talk about these four criteria a lot. And these are the things to really, if you come away with one thing from this presentation, it's to remember these four S's. When you're designing a, a crossing, you need to make sure you hit all of these points. And if you do, you will have a good crossing that will let the stream act like a stream. The idea is that we're going to mimic the natural stream um, through the underneath the road so that you have a stream that looks very similar to what it looks like upstream and downstream through the crossing and the fish can get through it. So if you span the stream, you make sure that your crossing is at least 1.2 times the bankful width of the stream. You set the elevation right. You need to make sure that your scour, your footers or the bottom of your structure, if it's an embedded structure, is below the scour depth of the stream so you don't have a problem of your, your under scour happening at the outlet and your culvert washing out. Um, you need to make sure your slope matches the stream. You don't wanna put the stream bed through your culvert at a different slope than what the stream wants to be at or else you're not gonna get the right dynamics to have that conveyor belt of sediment happening and you could have a lot more scour happening at your outlet than you want and could wash it out. And then substrate, you want to match the substrate in the crossing, the sediment that you put in the crossing um, should match what is, what is upstream and downstream. If you get all of those things right, then you're gonna follow this golden rule at the bottom here. You're gonna let the stream act like a stream. And that's the whole point of all of this is just to build a crossing that you can let the stream go underneath the road without having to change its character at all. So it will have a hydraulic connectivity upstream and downstream. And so today we're gonna to talk about the field assessment portion, which is kind of the most critical piece of this, of how do you get the data that you need on those four S's so you know what those criteria are. And then we're gonna briefly talk about how we take that field assessment and turn it into design criteria. Um, there, I will talk very slightly, just a slide on structure choice, hydrology and hydraulics. Um, that's kind of the last piece of this and is a little bit more of the engineering piece. So I didn't, it, there's a lot more there, but if you wanna know more about it, um, I can send you to some other resources that you'll see at the end of this presentation to get more information on that. Um, so we wanna replace a crossing. I'll we'll say it's this one. It's obviously got some problems. Um, the first thing that we need to understand is, is 
what is upstream and downstream of here? If we want to put um, a natural stream bed and let the stream act like a stream through this uh, road stream crossing, we need to know what that natural stream bed is. So we need to go out and we need to do a survey and gather some data to understand what the natural streams um, reference reach is, what the natural stream looks like so that then we can design that through our crossing. And it's comprised basically of three parts, the survey. Um, there's a longitudinal profile or a stream profile, um, which you get by going out to the stream, you stretch a, a, a tape, a tape measure along the bank of the stream or along the center line of the deepest point of the stream, or the thawweg, um, and you stretch that tape all the way um, from the top of where your survey is all the way to the bottom. And then you measure along that your stations, um, say you're five feet down that tape, you measure along that the um, elevation difference with a stadia rod of the bottom of your pools and the shallowest part of your riffle. And that's what uh, this little graphic, we're gonna look at these a lot more, um, is showing. So these are the top of the, top of the, the riffles, um, the shallowest part of the riffles, and then the depth of the pool. And you do that along here and you get this elevational gradient along your stream. The culvert in this case is right here and the road's right here. Uh, that's the top of the culvert. And this is what you need to, def to figure out how deep your scour um, depth is, where you need to put your footers, and what the slope of the stream is. Um, once we have that information, you also need to get um, some understanding of what the width of the stream is. Our first S is span the stream. Um, so we do a cross section. Um, so we, this, this picture is an example of that. You stretch a tape across the stream from bank to bank, a little bit farther than that, and then you measure the depths um, along that tape. And that gives you a graphic that looks something like this that tells you what the cross-sectional width is and also what the cross-sectional area is. So how much water is contained in that stream um, before it gets out into its floodplain. And then lastly is the substrate piece. So you can do um, a pebble count, you can do a grab sample, uh, you can use a gravelometer. There's several different ways, but basically you want to count and measure um, what the material is that makes up your stream bed so that you can understand what that is turn that into a specification uh, that you can give a contractor so he can go make a mix in a gravel pit that will be very similar to what you see in the stream. So you can put that um, underneath your, your road when you do your replacement. Um, and I just wanted to take a quick minute to talk about how a lot of these crossings perch over time. There's this concept of the influence of the culvert that's really critical when you're getting your longitudinal profile, when you're getting that stream profile. Um, and it has to do with the fact that most culverts are put in um, at smaller than bankful width. So they have a constriction effect that happens. The water's coming in, it's getting funneled down into the smaller section that's less, that's a lot um, less wide than the, the stream it is. And then um, coming out the back end causes a lot of scour. So you get um, water backing up at the inlet, which causes sediment to fall out, and then you get scour at the outlet which causes a scour pool, you purchase it, you've all probably seen lots of those, and then you also get the sediment accumulation, often we call it a sediment wedge on the upstream, which decreases the capacity of your culvert. Um, this is important when we're thinking about getting the stream profile, because we don't want to just measure those areas. That's not natural stream sections. Those sections only exist that way because that culvert's there. If you take that culvert out, the stream is not going to have that same characteristic. So this is an example of a stream profile that we've done. And you can see, if you look along this, there's some patterns that tend to emerge in the upper section and the lower section of where the, you have a long riffles um, with, with um, small little pools at the end of them, and then long riffle with a small pool at the end of it. Here, similarly. And then you get in this section right here, and you can see that there's, there's really um, short sections of pools. The pool riffle run sequence happens very quickly. This is an indication um, on the profile that you have a lot of sediment build up here. Uh, you can also see the plunge pool right here, that there's a big deep scour pool that you don't see a pool that's that deep anywhere else. These are indications that you have influence of the culvert. And if you were to go and do a survey like they used to do um, and just say, all I need to know is what I need to put, what slope I have to put my pipe in. So I'm just gonna go upstream 50 feet and downstream 50 feet, find a solid grade control, connect those two and get a slope. So if you were to do that, you'd be sitting here at maybe a two and a half, three percent slope. And you can see this line that is more averaged over the stream and what the stream actually wants to be at, if this culvert wasn't here, is at a two percent slope. 
So you'd end up putting on a pipe at a much, much greater slope than the stream actually wants. And then you'd have all of the correlative problems of a scour pool and, and sediment aggradation all over again. This is the impacted area of the culvert. So you will need to make sure that you get outside of that impacted area when you're trying to identify a natural section of stream that you want to um, put in where the culvert's going to be. So our rule of thumb is that you always go 20 to 30 times the channel width, both upstream and downstream, to ensure that you're outside the influence of that culvert. Um, in some cases, you might even have to go more. There are some crossings I've done that are really low gradient that you, we've had to go maybe 50 times the channel width upstream to find a section of stream that wasn't resulting of the culvert being undersized and causing a backwater above it. Um, but this is a good rule of thumb to do. So when you first go out for your survey, you measure your channel width, get a rough idea of say it's a 10 foot channel width, then you know you need to go at least 300 feet upstream to start looking for a reference channel reach, that natural channel section that you're going to gather the data on that section and then use that data to design your stream bed through your crossing. So the best way to do this is to make sure that you get that big 20 to 30 channel widths. This can seem pretty, um, it, it seems like a lot of work. Um, we typically can get one of these surveys done in a day. When you've been doing it for a while, you can sometimes get two of them done in a day. Um, it's not that hard of a thing to do, especially if you're just, um, if you're using the, the, the a total station or the right um, survey equipment. So as I said, the idea here is that we're trying to get a reference reach to um, design through your culvert. So in this example, you can see up here, this is a really good reference reach to look at. So we've done this profile, you go upstream, so you can train your eye to this a little bit when you're out in the field, um, but you're really gonna wanna do this analysis back uh, when, you, when you get back in, in your office. Um, and you can see there's a pretty consistent pattern here of pool, of riffle, pool, riffle, pool sequence that are all spaced pretty similarly. Um, and that's where you want to look for your reference reach. You can see down here, we've got that similar um, aggradation upstream of the culvert. We've got that scour pool down there. Those are all things you're gonna wanna ignore when you're doing this analysis because these are not created under natural conditions. So even though this scour pool might be really deep, we're not gonna analyze that when thinking about how much the stream can scour because the stream's never gonna have that constriction um, naturally in it that's gonna cause that much hydraulic pressure and result in that much scour. So we all wanna identify these um, reference reaches and then we're gonna gather the characteristics of those reference reach uh, to determine what we're gonna put in the culvert. And so in that reference reach, we're gonna wanna get a cross section. Um, cross section should always be done at a riffle. You never wanna do it at a pool because this cross section is largely to define what your bankful width is and what your cross sectional area is. So you know how to mimic that in your crossing. Um, if you do it at a pool, pools typically scour, and that's how they're formed, so they um, have, they generally over widen a little bit, so that would throw off your bank fold measurement. So you want to go to your riffle in your reference section, and you're going to stretch a tape across just like you would with your longitudinal profile, and measure down and get a sense as to how, what your cross-sectional area is, how deep the stream is, and then what your bank fold width is. Um, you typically want to go farther than just your bank to bank, um, you want to get some sense as to what your flood prone area is too. Um, in some streams, you might have very um, shallow banks, so there's not much of a bank, which means the water can get out in the floodplain very fast during a flood event. Um, and that could change your design criteria. In some cases where you're in a really flat section with low banks and have a really big floodplain, you might need to put in some floodplain relief um, culverts that are set at a bankful elevation. Um, so that when you have a flood event, you can bleed some of that capacity from the floodplain and can go through the road without having to be constricted into your culvert and cause that hydraulic pressure that causes a lot of scour. Um, and then also while you're at that riffle doing that cross section, you typically also get your pebble count. Um, as I said, there's several ways to do this. Um, what I typically do is just do what's called a Loman pebble count where you zigzag across the riffle um, from bank to bank and you um, step heel to toe across the stream and each step you um, put your finger down into the stream and pick up the first rock that you find and then you measure its intermediate access, the B axis. You don't want the longest access or the shortest access, you want the intermediate access uh, because that's what will fit through a sieve. 
The idea being once you have this, you can plot this and come up with a, a distribution that you can use to create a specification and tell your contractor to go mix up gravel of these different sizes to get your stream bed material. So that's what you pretty much it for the field assessment. And you get your longitudinal profile, you get a cross section, and you get your pebble count. Um, those are the three major things you need. And from that, you can derive those four S's to do your design, which we're going to talk about. Also, as with any field survey, it's good to get a lot of pictures um, and you're going to want to get some understanding as to uh, the road height. So we always take a shot to know how, how high the road is and what your existing culvert is so that we that will help us figure out how much fill we might have to take out when we go to construction. And so then we, we get this data and bring it back um, into into the office um, and, and start our design process. And the first thing that we, we want to identify is how big does this crossing need to be? How wide does it need to be? So we need to span the stream. We almost always want to do 1.2 times the bank full width of the stream. Um, bank full width, um, hopefully most people have heard of that before, but is basically just the width that the stream, um, the, it's the elevation that the stream will get out in the floodplain. So if you, typically you can kind of find it as just where, where the bank, the inflection point of the bank starts and you measure across that. Um, if you want to get into that more, I would encourage you to bank, uh, to uh, Google that. There's a lot of uh, really good information about how to figure out what bankful is, and it's not quite as simple as it seems. But the idea is you want to make sure that your crossing is as, as wide as the stream is. And then you add that 0.2, um, 1.2 times bankful width, you want to add in there so that you can build banks inside your structure. Um, you want to build those banks in there for several reasons. Um, the, one of the biggest ones is that it, it, prevent, it creates a... Um, a bench that um, turtles and uh, amphibians and mink and other species can use to get um, underneath the road without having to go over it. So we can solve a problem also for terrestrial um, animals that need to, to cross the road so they don't become roadkill. They can use that bank to get through it. Um, it also is pretty critical hydraulically to make sure that you're making the stream act like a stream. Um, the stream has banks, so you want to make sure that your, your culvert inside your culvert or inside your, your bridge um, has banks as well. And so um, we figure out what that span is just by this analysis of the cross section. Um, this is an example of, of a riffle uh, that we took a cross section on. So we're, you know, we identified one bank, the other bank, we stretched tape across it, we did our cross section, and we measured it in the field. Typically, we'll take several measurements in the field, and then when we get our um, graph back, we'll use those to verify. So our bank full width here is about 16.7 feet. So we want to go 1.2 of that. And that will say this is our structure length. I'm sorry, our structure width. Um, also gives us a sense as to what our, our bank full cross-sectional area is. So that will tell us how high those banks need to be when we build it too, because we want to mimic inside our, our structure something that looks very similar to this. I'm setting the elevation right. Uh, this is a, a very critical piece. And there's mostly around um, how to make sure that you don't scour your culvert out. So this has a big implication in public safety and, and infrastructure safety. Um, and it's a fairly simple analysis um, in this method. If you're going to be doing these crossings on a higher risk scenario, say on a, a public uh, municipal road um, or a state owned road or a provincial road, uh, you might need to get some scour calculations done. Um, engineers sometimes uh, want some more data to say that the stream isn't going to scour your footers out or get underneath your crossing. But this method, which is uh, the Forest Service Stream Simulation Design method, um, makes the assumption that uh, the stream is never going to be able to scour any deeper than the existing pools that it has. So what you do for this analysis is simply look at the deepest pool that's outside of the impacted section um, the deepest pool in your reference reach. Um, and that is the limit that you can scour. So you want to make sure that you put your footers um, well below that. Oops. Um, so this would define that limit. So you draw that line and you connect the deepest um, pools on your profile. And you know that you need to get your, um, your footer or the bottom of your culvert or, or a, um, concrete box below that. And we usually put a safety factor on that depending upon the substrate in the stream. So if this is a sand bed stream, then we might want to um, multiply uh, the depth of this pool times two 
uh, to make sure that we're well below that because sand's very mobile and it's likely that the um, during a high flow event that the, the stream will be scouring a bit below these pools. If it's a cobble uh, boulder stream, um, that stuff doesn't move very easily. So we're probably pretty safe just making sure we're, we're six inches to a foot below um, our scour line. And this is a good example of what not to do. Um, this is a crossing that was designed for the correct span. Um, they, they did their analysis and said we need to be uh, at, at bankful width. They put it in at bankful width, but they did not put it low enough. They didn't embed any um, material in the crossing, and their slope was wrong. And over two years, you can see that it scoured significantly down. And so there's about two feet of, of pool depth that has increased there um, the, to perch that. So it, I've heard before doing this work that, you know, if you just span the stream by bankful width, you solve all of your problems. And this is just a slide to indicate that's not the case. You really do need to think about these other characteristics too. Um, and then you want to make sure, obviously, your slope is um, very similar to the slope of your reference reach. So we're using that reference reach to define our slope, and we want our slope through our stream bed to match that. And that's another analysis of this longitudinal profile. So we've figured out what our pool scour limit here is. This is how deep the crossing needs to go. Um, and then we do a similar thing. Instead of connecting the bottom of those pools to get our scour limit, we want to connect the top of the features, the, the shallow parts of those riffles to each other. And we want to find where they, they line up pretty well in our reference reach. And then that defines our stream slope. So we're going to want to design our slope through our crossing at this 0.8% slope so that it matches our reference reach. And once we've done that, so we know what our slope needs to be. So our slope is going to look very similar to this um, going through our crossing when we take it out. So we'll take this old crossing out. We're going to dig a big hole all the way down below this scour limit, set our footers down below that, and then put in a crossing um, that is has enough capacity to handle the 100-year flood event, and then have a stream bed that goes it matches this line down through here. You can see that there's a lot of material above that. So that, that could present somewhat of a problem. Um, and there's, there's several ways you can handle it. If you've got the money and the permitting, um, you could go and go in and actually regrade the stream with your excavator. You could dig back and regrade all of this um, section and remove that material, um, use it to fill in down here to get that slope to match. Um, or what we typically end up doing is we let the stream do that for us. Um, we can start what's called a head cut, where you basically just create a really sharp inflection point in the stream. Um, and over time, if the um, sediment is, is pretty mobile, um, that's going to regrade itself back up um, to match the slope. So if you move this stream bed down to this elevation, this material is likely going to move out and regrade to make this slope. And we see that a lot when we do these. It's pretty common for us to start that head cut. Um, and then we'll end up with something similar to this. This is what this, the new stream bed will likely look like. It will regrade along that line with the tops of features roughly hitting that 0.8% slope. Um, this is a, a real world example of exactly um, that idea. So this is some monitoring that I've done um, before and after we've done a replacement. So this, uh, what we're looking at with this red dashed line is the longitudinal profile that we collected before we did anything. This red line is the old bottom of the stream bed where the old culvert was. Um, and the blue line is two years after replacement um, where they, uh, so it follows down here. And then this is the stream bed that was in place. The actual culvert would have, would have been higher for capacity reasons. And you can see all of this uh, hatched red is material that head cut out. It was a very sandy stream. Um, when we did the replacement, we started a head cut here and it removed all of this material, moved it downstream and filled in this old scour pool. This was where the old scour pool used to be um, and deposited the rest of that material down here. So now we've regraded that stream to the slope that we put in through the crossing, filled in that scour pool and moved a bunch of that material out. And we didn't do any of that physically. We just started that head cut. We reached up there with an excavator and dug a one foot waterfall basically. And that waterfall did the rest of the work for us over the next two years. Uh, the interesting thing about this as well is that all of that material, because there was such a difference in the slope from upstream to down, 
um, when it regraded, the material is still captured pretty locally. So we didn't cause a bunch of sedimentation to go downstream. We just took the material from here and roughly the same volume of material here is what filled in down here. So we're not causing this huge pulse of sediment to go downstream and cause some ecological problems that we all know that can. So now we've, we've got our span from our cross section. We know where a scour net needs to be from those bottoms of pools. Um, and we've defined what the slope needs to be by connecting those top of uh, riffle features in our, in our reference reach. And so now the, the final thing that we need to know is what the substrate in the crossing is. So we take that pebble count that we did uh, in our reference reach on that riffle and we uh, plot it like this. This gives us some size classes and understanding of what the distribution is. So you can see that um, you know, the middle of our distribution is, is right about in the, the large gravel. Um, size class. So you'd want a large portion of your, your material to be that. And then um, as it goes down, you would size this stuff correctly. It can be difficult to turn this into a specification for a contractor. Um, I've typically, when I do these things, I'm there with them and I will take this, turn this into a specification for myself and then go to the pit with them and tell them to make the mix. And I'll choose, you know, take a little bit from that pile, a little bit from this pile, a little bit from that pile and mix it up in the back of the dump truck. Um, that, again, if, you, if your risk profile is low, a lot of the crossings I'm working on are um, forest roads or, or low volume roads. Um, that can work. If you're on a very um, high risk site, then you're probably going to want to hire an engineer to do this analysis and develop a spec for you. Um, this is critically important if you're doing a um, embedded culvert. If you don't get this right and you put that material in there and it's not sized correctly, if it's too big or too small, um, then you you interrupt that conveyor belt action during those flood events and you'll you can end up with a lot of material grading and decreasing the capacity inside your culvert or you can end up with all of the material going downstream really fast and then you just end up with a, a you know concrete bottom box culvert without any material in it um, so it's it's a really important piece of it and it, it can can um, trip people up a little bit but if you're confused about this this is definitely an area where you might want to hire And then those are pretty much all of the criteria that you need to know um, in order to design that stream bed through the crossing. So now the question becomes, okay, what kind of structure do we use and how big does it need to be? So if we know those four S's, if we know what the span of the stream is, we know what our scour depths are so we can set our elevations correctly, um, we know what the slope of the stream wants to be in that natural section, and we know what the substrate is, that's all of what the stream is telling us to build that stream bed through the crossing. Now we need to think about the people piece and say, okay, what kind of structure do we use? And this is an area, again, um, depending on your risk profile, uh, if it's pretty uh, low risk, you can, uh, you can probably do most of this yourself. You can pick, pick your size, you can talk with maybe your foresters or your road manager and they can let you know some stuff about load ratings um, and it's something you can do on your own. Um, if, it, if you have higher risk in, in higher volume roads, in uh, roads that ownership um, are, are public ownership, you, this is where you're probably going to want to think about hiring an engineer to make sure that you're putting in the right kind of structure, that the structure has the right load rating, and that you have your, your abutments are, are designed correctly to handle everything. But these are some options that uh, range in expense. This is uh, one we do very typically. Um, it's a uh, it's not really a waste block bridge. These are, are a little bit more engineered and concrete than that, um, but they're just blocks. They have uh, shear knobs on them, so they all fit together like Legos. Um, you can epoxy them together if you need to make sure that they stay together more, and then you have these tieback blocks to, to deal with uh, the um, fact that sometimes they want to cave in on themselves. Um, and you bury that in there, and that that on a you know 10 to 16 foot width here, that's 50 feet long on a, a forest road is around a $40,000 install. Um, concrete arches as well, these are very cost effective. Um, and then you get into uh, these low profile arches, these get to be more expensive, they can be difficult to put in because they have all these um, ribs on them for structural integrity, and then uh, elliptical pipes. There's other options out there too, these are just some samples of things that you might want, uh, want to use. And then uh, finally, I just briefly wanted to talk about hydrology and hydraulics. Again, depending on your risk profile and your how comfortable you are with this stuff, this is might be where you want to get the engineer in. Um, I, I like to think uh, that you, 
most people can do kind of the field assessment and, and get the understanding of those four S's as the criteria. And then that's a good time to take that to an engineer and say, this is what I want. Um, I found a lot of the engineers I work with don't know this method. They don't understand in some cases why this is important. So it's it can be really important for you to go get that data and say, these are important things that I want you to engineer this crossing to. Um, when you get into a hydrology and a hydraulics, you're going to have to do some kind of modeling um, to understand how your culvert is going to perform in different flood events. Um, so th this is a tool that uh, in the states we have is called StreamStats. Um, and it's an online web tool where you can go click on a point in the stream and it will delineate your watershed for you um, and then spit out um, a bunch of statistics about it. And the ones being important are these return interval flood events. Um, so for us, we're always looking to design for a hundred year flood so that we run this, I run this on my crossings and I get this 115.3 cubic feet per second. And then I use that to input into this program, which is called HY8. Um, it's a federal highways um, modeling program. It's pretty simple to run. Um, if you've got an aptitude for computer programs and know a little bit about hydraulics, uh, you, can, you can do this. The inputs are pretty simple. Um, and then this tells us um, where the water will be, how high the water will be on the upstream end, whether or not it's going to overtop the road or not um, at that, that flood event. So you can see here, this is 115.3 CFS. Um, this is the 100 year flood and it says our, our um, gives our parameters here, our headwater elevation is 95. So that's this line right here saying that a 100 year event, this is where the water will be. We've got plenty of capacity in this culvert. Um, it's usually we're designing with 20% capacity um, at that 100 year event so that we'll pass those flows without any problem. So this piece really gets at that, that flood risk um, aspect. If you're designing these things correctly so that the stream can act like a stream, then you get the ancillary benefits of fish being able to get through it without a problem. And you've got plenty of capacity in that culvert so that you don't have any issues with um, potential flood failure. And so if you've done all of these things, you can get yourself to something that should look very similar to this. Um, this, is a, this is what you want to look like when you're done. You can see that the substrate going through the crossing is identical to what's upstream and down. You don't see any major waterfalls or inflection points because the slope wasn't done correctly. Um, our arch is plenty big enough um, to handle the, the biggest flow events that we'd see here. You can see where the old one um, was much too small and how it's constricting all the flow here. Um, and it's got nice big banks on it that are going to help with that, um, the, hydraulic, the hydraulics of it, um, slowing the water down as it goes through it, as well as providing an opportunity for um, mammals and amphibians to get through the crossing without having to go over the road. So all of those four S's are represented here. Um, and just to hit them again, because they're the most important part, uh, make sure that you're spanning the stream. Make sure that you set that elevation right. You know that um, how deep you need to get your footers so that they're below the scour depth of the stream. You want to make sure that your slope is homogeneous from upstream to downstream, so you don't have any problems with waterfalls that could prevent um, fish from getting up. And you want to install substrate that is identical or very similar to what your reference reaches, so you don't have problems with that sediment conveyor belt getting interrupted during those high flow events. And back to the golden rule again, this is all designed to let the stream act like a stream. So that's um, just about at time. Um, just very quickly want to um, give a shout out to all of our partners. Um, none of this stuff is done in a vacuum. All of these people listed here were um, integral in the Stream Smart program, as well as a lot of the projects we're doing. So it's critically important, obviously, to make sure you're working with it, all of your partners really well. And then just have some useful links here that you all um, can go to to get more information about any of this stuff. Uh, the Maine Audubon uh, Stream Smart has a lot of data on it um, and that you can use some spreadsheets that will help walk you through some of the um, longitudinal profile stuff um, to get your survey data into, uh, into a, um, a design uh, phase. And uh, then also the Forest Service Stream Simulation Design Manual, which is like a 300 page manual that really dives in depth on all of these things. Um, stream stats, there's some of the other stuff here. And then the last one's just a, a good study um, showing how when you do the stream simulation design, um, they, there was a, a hurricane event in Vermont where they showed um, these crossings that were put in this way um, it did not blow out at all, even though they saw a 500 plus year event um, because they were designed correctly. 
and I am at time and happy to take any questions and get into this anymore. Thank you all for taking the time to listen. Ben, thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation and so much uh, great information there. Um, so as Ben said, we'll now open the session for question and answers. Um, you uh, can have a couple of options as a participant to ask questions uh, using your webinar control panel, which is the little gray box you should be seeing in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Um, you can ask your question directly uh, using your audio by uh, clicking on the icon to raise your hand and we can unmute your microphone um, so that you can ask your question directly or you can type in your question in the control panel and I'll read it aloud for you. Okay, so we've already got a few questions uh, coming in. Um, Sandra Jensen has her hand raised. Sandra, are you there? Sandra, did you have a question? Okay, uh, maybe her microphone isn't working, so Sandra will just ask you to type in your question if you don't mind. Um, uh, I have a question here from Catherine Collette who asks, um, what, let me just see here. Um, many of the culverts look like concrete, presumably precast. What is the smallest available? What would be the most common structure type for very small forest roads? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we're finding concrete can be a lot more cost effective um, than a lot of the aluminum uh, or steel products out there. Um, concrete, they, they make them pretty small. Um, I think generally uh, the smallest I probably put in was a 12 foot um, concrete arch, which was very cost effective. Um, but there's a, a variety of those concrete waste blocks for forest roads are probably the the easiest thing to do where you just have you know kind of modular blocks and you basically build an abutment wall like legos and then plop some steel on top of it and put a either a concrete or a wood deck on it um and if you you're not as worried about uh design life um that the design life of the, the wood obviously you'd have to replace that every couple of years um but that that can be a really cost effective solution for forest roads um, another thing that that we like to see a lot on forest roads is just putting abutments in and then using temporary bridge decks so you can just put those abutments in, bury them, and have um, you know those blocks built up like Legos, and then put a temporary bridge deck on, and then pull the bridge deck when you're done with the cutting. And then when you come back in 20 years, you can just do it again. Great, thank you. Um, we uh, received a couple of inquiries for copies of the presentation. So I will let folks know that we are recording the presentation today, and it will be available on our YouTube channel uh, later on this afternoon. Um, so that is one option for folks. Um, ben, would you be willing to share a PDF as well of the presentation? Is that possible sure. or would you prefer the recording? Um, I can I can make it in a PDF, yep. Okay, perfect, uh, so you. that will be great. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next question is from Josiane Gauguin. Uh, when installing an embedded culvert, will the sediment uh, deposit naturally within the culvert in some cases, or do you have to backfill in every case? Um, I think there are some limited cases where it might. Um, you'd have to have relatively low slopes, but I would not recommend not backfilling it. Um, you, Because of that kind of conveyor belt I was talking about, you need to have the same sediment um, available across the bed um, on the upstream and downstream side. Um, basically, it's, it's called the live bed uh, concept. So when you have uh, high flow, uh, most of that material is moving. So whatever you backfill the culvert with, after you have, uh, say, a 10-year flood event, none of the same material that you put in there is going to be there. That's going to have moved downstream, but then material from upstream is, should come in and fill that in. But if you interrupt that um, process by just having, uh, by not having anything in there, uh, and relying on the stream to fill it in, you could really screw up that that uh, process so that it wouldn't work as well. In addition to the fact that the bottom of the culvert um, is typically not rough, um, roughness is a really big thing in the in the equations that define um, how water what what velocity water has. And so if you've got a really um, smooth surface, that water velocity is going to speed up quite a lot going through the culvert. And because it's going faster, it's going to have a much better ability to pick up sediment. So that's that's really going to mess up that conveyor belt um, process. So maybe, uh, certainly there could be some situations if you want to talk to a professional geomorphologist, they could 
answer that, but I would very highly not recommend doing that because I think it would it would mess things up. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Adam Kirk Hecker. Uh, what are the considerations for low flow design? Yeah, I didn't hit that as much as probably I should have, but um, when we looked at those um, cross-sectional profiles, you can see where there's that, um, the center of the channel called the Falweg, which is the lowest point. Typically it's kind of a V in the center or, or to the side of that cross-section. Um, again, if, if you set your slope right, and you get the right uh, substrate in there, then the stream is gonna carve that thaw leg for you and you're gonna have that low flow. So this whole idea behind this is if you let the stream act like a stream, then the stream is gonna have that low flow channel. Um, if you're very concerned about it, you can, uh, some of those programs I showed, the HY8 program will allow you to model low flows. So oftentimes in, in addition to modeling the high flows to see you know what how well it's going to perform at a hundred year flood event i will also look at uh, say 10 percent of bank full flow and model that through the culvert to make sure that i'm still having enough depth and velocity um, in the center of the channel to allow for fish passage thank you uh the next question comes from amelie Thériault. uh what which is the maximum slope for a stream simulation that you suggest um, well, it really depends on the stream. So it's, it's you need to match the stream. Um, in some cases, you can have streams that are more than six percent. Typically, streams range from, you know, it's from close to zero to around six percent is kind of your average stream slope. Certainly, in in certain mountainous areas, you can have more than that. Then your bed form is going to change. So in a six percent plus stream, you're going to have step pools. And it's the same idea. You're going to want to design step pulls through your crossing. Um, that might designing that bed is going to be significantly different than just saying, "Oh, I'm going to get a mix of material um, and throw that in there." You're actually going to have to design, you know, some rock ribs um, and and pools in there so that you get that step pool. So for using this this method that I'm talking about, you're probably going to want to stick, um, you know, no more than a three to four percent range. If you start getting outside of that, and your bed form shows that you're getting really a step pool form with big boulders, um, you're probably going to want to hire an engineer and design um, a step pools through your crossing at that six percent grade. Great, thank you, um, Alicia. Bernier asks, uh, do you have an opinion on what an appropriate culvert span width would be when the headwaters of a watershed are expected to become 90% impervious within 10 years of culvert installation? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, so I would suggest in that case, using some models, there's, I'm not quite sure what models are available um, north of me here, but um, there's the stream stats is one way to look at what those incoming flows are. There's also other models, uh, TR55, TR20, um, and HydroCAD that some are in, built in. If you're an engineer, it's built into your AutoCAD software. Um, they all use a similar method, which is basically routing flow across a landscape that takes into account uh, the land cover um, types. So you could use that model to do a sensitivity analysis to say, right now, this is what the incoming flows are. Um, but if I change that criteria to say it's 90% um, impervious, then the incoming flows are going to increase to X and then use that flow as your design. Um, but it's, it's not a one size fits all. The, the stream um, span is, is part of it. I think in general, your, your stream channel uh, shouldn't change too much based on that. It's more what your flood flows are going to be if you have those impervious surfaces. Hopefully, your stream width will still be relatively the same. It might get a little, it, it would more likely get deeper than it would get wider. But you're definitely going to want to make sure that you've got a big enough crossing to handle that increased capacity because you're definitely going to have a lot more flow hitting that culvert. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Melissa Smith, who, who writes, great presentation. Uh, we see a number of double culverts in BC and are wondering what the main issues with this type of structure are. I'm sorry, double culverts? Double culverts, yes. Um, so the problem with double culverts is that you're, the, you're still contracting flow. Even if you might have enough capacity, the action, uh, the vena contractions, the, the physics of it, of, of squeezing water into that smaller space really accelerates the velocities at the outside of that culvert. 
Um, so it's going to cause problems similarly to what we saw on the downstream end where you have scour, on the upstream end where you have sediment starting to build up in a grade and decreasing your capacity. Um, in addition, it's also you're getting velocities in the pipe that are going to make it really hard for fish to migrate through. So you, if you have double pipes, even if they are at a big enough capacity, even if they are at grade and you don't have those scour things happen, um, you're, you're that the way that, that those pipe works and the physics of water moving through it um, is going to see some pretty high velocities that a fish is not going to be able to swim all the way through that pipe. One of the great things about this method, the stream spark method, is that when you put in a stream bed in through the culvert, you're creating lots of little eddies and little pools behind rocks that can fish can uh, rest in as they're going through. So if they've got a 100 foot section of pipe that they're going through, they might not be able to make that all at you know 10 feet per second of the water coming through, but they might make it five feet and be able to hide behind a rock, recover, and then go five feet up to the next rock and recover. So this method allows them to do that. Whereas if you've just got a straight pipe, even if it's enough capacity, that means they've got to make it through that 100 feet at 10 feet per second, and a lot of them will be able to do that. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Bob Vadis Jr., um, who asks, what about planning ahead for climate change differences as is being addressed in Washington, given widening of bankful widths? And he then references an article written by uh, Will Hear and colleagues. Um, yeah, so we're currently not um, looking at that explicitly, other than that's part of the 100-year um, design criteria. Um, I'd love to see that paper on the widening. I've not been aware that that was a significant concern from uh, climate change, um, but it does make some sense to me that it, it could be. Um, I think a lot of it depends on your, your geography as well and how steep your stream slopes are, et cetera. But um, the reason that we have that 100 year design criteria is to capture the fact that we're likely seeing more storm events more frequently. So we wanna make sure these things are upsized enough. The reality is, is that it's called a 100 year uh, storm event based on the past record of statistics. It's probably more likely like a 75 or 50 year event that we're seeing now. But the previous design criteria was 25 years. So we feel like if we design them at that level, we're not overbuilding them to the point where we're spending way more money than we need to, but we're still giving them enough capacity that they should be able to handle <clears throat> the shifting uh, water volumes that we're seeing based on climate change. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Stefano Strapazon. Um, what culvert types materials would you consider if concrete was not an option due to weather, freeze, and thaw stress? Yeah, so there, there's plenty of options out there. Um, steel and aluminum are, are both very good options, depending a lot on your um, soil pH. Um, it really, it's kind of site specific. Concrete can be very useful in some areas. Um, the aluminum can work if you don't have really uh, low pHs hitting your aluminum and oxidizing it fast. <clears throat> um, that I, there, there isn't any that I know of that are plastic right now um, because that typically is really hard to get the structural integrity at the sizes that you need. Um, but I'd encourage you to look at uh, Contech makes a lot of these products, C-O-N-T-E-C-H. Um, that you can look and they make a wide variety of different metal arch structures uh, that, that are very applicable for this type of stuff. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Will Daniels who asks, um, or states first, great presentation. Uh, good to hear some emphasis on other important ecological flows other than fish. My question is, are there other arguments and or stats that you often use when talking to town and or state managers in reference to the human benefit? For example, lifespan, flood risk, et cetera. Yeah, so lifespan is definitely a big one. Um, we tend to estimate a 75 to 100 year design life for uh, a concrete um, culvert, a, a you know, variety of, of sizes. Um, that's something I always hit. Um, that, and that makes sense to, to most town managers. And then the flood risk stuff is something that I've been working on for a while to, to show people that you know what's existing out there is really, there's a large portion of it is undersized. And especially with the extreme storm events we're seeing in Maine increasing dramatically, um, it makes a lot of sense to town managers to, to replace these things. Really, I find the biggest issue is cost. Um, we're the cost differential for what they would do versus what we're asking them to do um, can can range from 100 to, to 300 percent 
Um, and that can be really hard for the town managers to swallow. It's usually not very hard to get them to agree that they need to do put in a bigger crossing that's better for, for flood risk and for fish passage. Um, it's paying for it that is where it, it gets tricky. And we're working on different methods to do that, but I would say that's that's the harder argument is to say to spend the money on it, not that it's a good idea. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Catherine Collette. Uh, she asks, in terms of small private woodlot owners, would they be hiring people to do the design work? Um, th that depends a lot on the how complex the crossing is and how comfortable the, the woodlot landowner is and what their uh, risk exposure is. So if it's just a private road that they own um, and they're pretty competent and understand, you know, the basic principles we've laid out here, I think it's something you can do yourself. Um, if if there's more risk of uh, other people driving over that road or they don't have a good understanding of that, uh, you might want to hire it out. I typically kind of do a hybrid. Um, so I'll do the surveys. I'll do the analysis and say this is what I want the stream, uh, what I want it to look like in terms of what the stream should look like. And then I hand it over to an engineer to finish doing the, the road profile um, and the structure design part, because that, that's the piece where there's more risk involved. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Erica Ouellette. Uh, she asks, during your studies, did you consider the effect of stream mobility on the sediment charge and pool step patterns? I'm not quite sure I'm grasping what that question is. Um, I think I, maybe you're referring to the fact that at, at higher flows, the scour, um, you know, the, the bottoms of those pools could be significantly more if you've say got a stream uh, sand bed and that, that material will all be mobile. Um, we do consider that mostly just in the safety factor that we put on the scour depth. Um, when we draw that scour line to say we need to put our footers below that, um, we put that safety factor on there based on what the stream bed material is. So we could say that the pool depth is, you know, say one foot is our max pool depth, but it's a sand bed stream. So then we'll make sure our footer is two or two and a half feet below that one foot line, because we know that that material will be mobile at higher flows. I'm not sure I understood that correctly, but if not, please uh, ask a clarifying question. Thank you. Uh, next question from Melissa Smith. Um, is installing fish baffles prohibitive to stream hydraulics or is it actually beneficial? Um, I tend to not like doing fish baffles unless you really have no other option. Um, you don't get all of those other benefits to the stream. Um, you're only targeting usually one fish species because baffles have to be specifically designed for the, out, the velocity um, of the, the notch in the weir. Um, and that's typically for whatever fish species you're looking at. Um, certainly there's some uses of it that work. Uh, I've seen some work in, in tidal areas uh, for smelt, for example, or alewives, um, but there really wasn't any other option at, the, at those sites. Um, they do, they can be a problem for hydraulics. So you're decrease, if you put baffles in, you're going to decrease the capacity of that crossing to pass flood flows. So you need to upsize it if you're going to do that. It needs to increase the size so that that backwater effect of the water hitting those baffles isn't significant enough that it'll go over the road. Um, there is somebody in uh, New Zealand who's doing some pretty cool stuff with uh, plastic baffles that he bolts into culverts to retrofit them um, and they can help um, you know make pools and, and weirs for fish to get through but then they lie down at high flows when they get so much velocity they just push right down so they don't increase uh, decrease the capacity so that can be solutions um, I think if, you, if you're going to take the time to replace the culvert I think it makes a lot of sense to use these methods if you really don't have the money or, or the, the availability to do that, then you know maybe doing a retrofit with baffles is your only option. Thank you. Uh, next question from Bob Vadis Jr. Um, how deeply should a culvert be countersunk into the stream bed? So that's where that, that scour depth calculation comes in is you, it should be countersunk below wherever the max uh, pool depth that you see um, on your longitudinal profile. So we usually connect those pieces. Um, maybe I can try to find that again here. Um, yeah, so this is a good example. So you can see there's a max pool uh, depth here and we connected it down here and there's some pretty good agreement from the upper and lower sections through here. So we would want to make sure that we're countersunk below that um, deep enough that you can uh, embed the culvert to bring it up to whatever stream grade that your slope has told you it should be at. 
Um, so you want to you want to be below that that max scour line. You don't want to have um, water coming out of the inlet and getting underneath um, the the invert of that pipe. Um, the next question, thank you. The next question comes from Josiane Gauguin, uh, who asks, do you often have issues with permeability of the substrate in the culvert, uh, that is water undercutting the fill, and have you addressed this if it occurs? Yes, this is a very good point. Thank you for bringing that up. I did not talk about that, and I really should have. Um, part of the sediment um, distribution um, problem here. So we we spec a you know size class of material and a, a mix of, of you know gravel and sand that we put in the culvert. Um, one thing that we always do is we always bump up the bottom size classes. So the sand and silt size class we bump up by 10% uh, because that's usually underrepresented in our pebble count sample. And then we always spend several hours in some cases washing that bed in. So we actually put it all down and then we go over with a hose and we wash all of that material until the water sheets off of the top of that substrate. Um, and that's a really critical piece to do. If you don't do that, and I've seen contractors that haven't, you'll have the stream come in and then it just dives and goes under underneath your substrate. And you don't, it takes sometimes a year for the stream to work itself out and get a channel back in there. So you actually have surface water. So it's a really critical piece to make sure you wash that sediment in and seal that bed what you're doing is just taking all those size, those small size fractions, the sand and silt, and hydraulically pressing it into the gravel so that the water can't get through those interstitial spaces anymore and has to stay perched up on top of the stream bed. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Amélie Thériault. Uh, what about taking the excavated bed material for the culvert's bottom and add some boulders uh, from the bank instead of doing the pebble count? Um, Certainly, so I have done some projects. I, so I wouldn't never say not to do the pebble count. I think the pebble count gives you an idea of what you're looking for. Um, if you do the pebble count and you find that what you've excavated um, in the installation process is very similar to that, then certainly you can use that. And I've done that before. In fact, one of the recommendations um, I often give is that if you take the old culvert out, oftentimes the stream bed material is right underneath it. They just put it right on top of the old stream bed when they installed it. And if you can excavate small trenches to put your footers in, assuming you're doing an open bottom structure, um, you can often just leave that there and then build your structure out and then let the stream go back into that, that old stream bed and it will, it will work very well that way. But yes, you, you, I think it's a very good idea to do that, but I wouldn't recommend not doing the pebble count. I think verifying that that is indeed what you're looking for is an important piece of this. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Sally Betts. She asks, in natural systems, streams migrate across their floodplains. Can this methodology incorporate consideration of channel migration? Uh, that's a very good point. Um, the method is stream simulation design. So we're trying to simulate um, what the stream wants. That has a lot to do with your skew. So how the alignment um, of your culvert comes in. Um, you can design for that. I think what typically we find is that the, the periodicity of that um, meander pattern is usually um, longer than the design life of the culvert. So in at least in our, our systems, I'm sure certainly if you go to Alaska or a glacial outwash system, that would not be true. Um, but in most of our systems, those streams are not migrating laterally um, fast enough that it would make sense to put in two or three culverts to do that. So the idea would be that you put in your culvert and then when you replace it next time, you do an analysis to say, is this where the stream really wants to go? Maybe we should move it to a different spot. Um, but it's, it's not, it, that's not a great answer to that, I think. Um, that comes into you know the the problems with people in transportation networks and streams. That's another one that could use some more thought on how to solve that better. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Mike Hunka, who asks, uh, "I was wondering if you could provide some costing of various types of structures. We are currently addressing fish passage issues on many of our resource roads in Alberta, and owners are often negating arch-type crossings due to cost. If I was able to look at other cost-effective options, that would help move replacements to more effective watercourse crossings." Yeah, so I can't really provide anything right now. We've we've been struggling with that issue to get some solid numbers. 
they're very variable depending on a number of factors. For, for example, in Maine right now, um, we're having a labor shortage. So our um, construction costs, uh, our contractors costs, our bids are coming back at two or 300% of our engineer cost estimates. Um, so it makes it really difficult to get at um, what the installation cost is. Um, for actual structure costs, um, you can get those from the manufacturers themselves. If you just reach out to the manufacturer, they can tell you. Um, I will flash a couple of slides at you that I didn't get in the presentation because I didn't have time. Um, this one namely uh, shows the cost differential of a traditional um, corrugated metal pipe that's undersized, that has a 25 year design life. So this bump in cost is a replacement over time, comparing it to an arch culvert or a box culvert. And essentially what this says is over a 50 year time span, you'll be saving anywhere from 10 to $20,000 um over the life of it because you're not going to have to do maintenance and replace um the, the, the smaller arch pipe um it's it's a hard argument to make um it it's hard to get people to think at that time frame if you can get them to think at that time frame um then the economics work out pretty well Thank you very much. Um, so I think that's the end of our very lively question and answer period. Um, just the sheer number of questions I think speaks to how keen people are on this topic, Ben, and, and the quality of your presentation. Thank you again so much. Mm -hmm. And do, do people uh, have access to my email address? Because I'm happy to continue conversations uh, offline as well. Um, uh, if, if you'd like to pop it up now on the screen, that would be great. Or if folks want to get in touch with me, I can forward along any messages uh, that people would like to share with you. Okay, I can just put it up on this slide real quick. Um, people can find it. Well, then doing that, um, I'll just remind folks that our next webinar is going to be held on November 13th. Uh, Dr. Sylvain Jutra of Laval University will be speaking about water and forest road networks in Quebec, issues and solutions. So uh, again, a topic that's uh, very pertinent to, to what we've been chatting about today. And that presentation will be in English. And hopefully everybody can read that. Great, yep, that's nice and clear, Ben, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, a huge thank you to Ben and um, a thank you as well to everybody who participated today. We hope you can all join us again soon. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. And please feel free to reach out if you want to chat about this more. I live this stuff. Thanks so much, Ben. Thanks. Bye.